Okay, so my name is Martin Sustrik. Uh, I am the original designer of ZeroMQ and I wrote most of the code and I'm going to speak about it today. Uh, originally, I wanted to start with some you know, background for distributed computing and messaging, but Chris did a good job in introducing it, so I'll skip that. Uh, maybe just one point to add to that is like 10 years ago, uh, it, it made really a sense to write monolithic applications because, because what you had was just a single computer at home and that was it. So to, today what you have at home is uh, your computer and your laptop and uh, your mobile phone or, and you know, your girlfriend's computer and your girlfriend's uh, mobile phone and a lot of processors all over the place. and. Then, of course, if you are deploying applications, you can get a cluster at Amazon for a few dollars, like 100 nodes, like no problem. Uh, well, also, even if you are writing an application for a single computer, uh, you have two cores in the laptop, you have four cores in your desktop, you have eight or 16 cores in the server, so you still have to distribute the work between the different cores on the machine. So whatever we are doing today, it, it should be distributed. Okay, so uh, ZeroMQ is a tool that helps you uh, to distribute work and th this talk is going to be quite technical. So it, it won't, the, fifth, the philosophy was presented by Chris and this will be just <coughs> the technical part. Uh, okay, uh, one thing is uh, we are forking ZeroMQ at the moment because uh, of some uh, trademark issues. So maybe in the future you would uh, hear about Crossroads rather than ZeroMQ. Uh, but from uh, your po point as a developer, there, there's no difference. Uh, also, uh, I am not a Ruby programmer, so if you afterwards you have any questions about the Ruby API, ask Lorenz Node there. Uh, he's maintaining one of the uh, stand up. <laughs> that, that guy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, he's maintaining uh, one of the Ruby bindings, so he's more familiar with the Ruby API. I have uh, Ruby examples in the presentation, but I'm not a Ruby programmer, so there are probably some syntax errors. And Thank you. Okay, <laughs> fine. So, so the, the, the very basic thing you can do with, <clears throat> uh, with distributed applications is something like you have application A and application B. Application A says hello and application B really replies world. So how we do implement that using ZeroMQ? And here goes the code. Uh, <clears throat> this is the application. Okay, well, let, let's think of one of them as a client and other one as a server. The client says hello and, and server re replies world. So th this is the client. And as you see, it's uh, quite simple. Uh, you, you, mm, ZeroMQ is a socket library, so it's, uh, you are probably familiar with uh, standard POSIX BSD sockets. So it's very similar. Uh, you just create a socket. And, uh, oh, well, first you create a context, which is just some kind of shared state. You don't have to care about it. Then you create a socket, and you specify the type, uh, which means rec as a requester. So a requester is someone who sends requests and get replies. Uh, then you connect your, connect your socket to the <clears throat> to the server, and you send the hello, and you get the reply and print it to the console. That's it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven lines of code. At the server side, basically the same thing. Uh, what's different here is that the socket type is rep, meaning replier. Replier is someone who gets requests and sends replies. Uh, and instead of connecting it to some uh, remote endpoint, you bind it, meaning you create uh, a server. Yeah? So in this case, you are binding to the port 5559. And then the server is running all the time, so there's an infinite loop. It just uh, gets the requests from the client, and to every request, it just replies, BERT. Easy. Yeah? Now, uh, the important thing here is that uh, this code, okay, so this one and this one, works for application A and application B, but it also works in topology like, like this one. No change to code. Uh, the code you, you've just seen is able to handle many clients. So 
uh, the, <clears throat> the server part can handle like tens of thousands of uh, clients in the parallel. And you don't really have to add any code uh, to, to do that. Uh, ZeroMQ uh, handles the establishment of connection for you. It handles reconnections. So for example, uh, if the network fails and gets restarted, the connection will reestablish itself. You don't have to care about that. Yeah? Uh, also, if the, if the server fails, the clients keep running and when you restart the server, it reconnects and everything keeps working. Yeah. So actually what you can do uh, is something you can do with TCP sockets is you can start the client first and then start the server and it will work. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> what about this? So what uh, if we want to have just one client to speak to many servers? But the case may be uh, when you want to do some kind of load balancing, right? So <clears throat> maybe you have a, your web service has many, many clients and uh, one box is not enough to serve all the requests. So you want to start uh, the several instances of the server and you want to load balance the work. So in this case, the client is connected to several servers and the uh, Request one goes to first server, request two goes to the second server, request three goes to first server, and so on. It's <coughs> just, just simple uh, round robinning. Uh, once again, you don't really have to change the code for this. You just uh, run it and it works. Uh, one thing, th this is just an example. Uh, if you, the interesting thing about ZeroMQ sockets is that you can connect several times. As the single sockets, uh, socket can handle many connections, what you can do is create a socket and do, do connect, connect, connect to, 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 to different or even connect, bind, connect, bind, whatever you want. Yeah? So in this case, we are connecting <clears throat> the client to three different servers. But uh, you can also do it the other way around. You can bind the client and connect from the servers to the client. Well, it, it's, it's up to you. And uh, once again, the application log logic is uh, very simple, just, just a loop send, receive. <clears throat> okay, so what about if you want to distribute the same data to, to many clients? Yeah. This happens often, like if you are, for example, well, uh, um, my background is the financial industry, so this kind of model is you know, like distributing uh, stock prices to, to the clients, but you can also think of it as di distributing weather updates or distributing uh, game state to, to the clients and so on. So you want to, uh, to send the same data to many clients. So here's an example. Once again, it's almost the same. So you, you create a socket, but uh, see, there's a different socket type. It's pub, meaning publisher. So th this is the socket that sends the same message to everyone. Uh, the sockets we've seen before were all load balancing. This one is distributing. Uh, bind the socket to the TCP port, send hello every second. That's it. And uh, client side, once, once again, very similar. Uh, the, the socket type is sub, subscriber. You connect to the server. Okay, you, you also see that the ZeroMQ does name resolving for you. So you, you don't have to you know, fill in all the, the complex structures. Like in BSD sockets, you just give the server name and the port, and it gets resolved. Uh, and then in the loop, then you are you just receive the data, the, the message, and you print it to the console. Uh, one special thing about um, subsockets is uh, there is a built-in filtering. So uh, in some use cases, you don't want to receive all the messages, but just subset of messages. So for example, if you are distributing like stock prices, uh, the client might, might, be, might be interesting only in 
I know, Cisco stock, and so it wants to filter just a subset of, uh, of all the messages. So that's what uh, ZMQ subscribe socket option is for. So, well, it, in this case, it subscribes for all messages. It just says uh, everything that starts with empty string uh, is something I, wa I want. But uh, you, you can say uh, subscribe for ABC, and you get all the messages that start with ABC. Uh, one thing that uh, new versions of uh, ZeroMQ do, do for you is mm, so-called subscription forwarding, which means that uh, when you are filtering messages, it, that doesn't happen at the client, but rather the subscription is sent to the, uh, to the publisher and the publisher filters the messages. That means that uh, even if you, if you have a huge load of messages, like, I don't know, 10 gigabits, and you filter just some specific subset that that's you know, one message a second, your, your network will be empty. Of course, the only the, the, the messages you subscribe for are actually sent to the network. Mm. Okay, the same socket types, but the other way around. So in this case, we have many publishers and just one subscriber. So uh, what can we use this for? Uh, this is the classic scenario for logging, for example. You have many applications. Each application sends some, some kind of logs to the central server, and the central server displays the, the logs or stores them in a database or something. Once again, you don't have to change the code. The same code works, uh, the one we've, we've just seen. Okay. Uh, okay, so these are uh, two basic patterns. There are some more. Uh, which I am not going to go into now because it's only 30 minute talks, but uh, you can look it up in the guide and in the documentation. So <clears throat> the, now the important thing is, okay, we have this kind of infrastructure, but uh, how we are going to use it, actually. So this is an example of, of how to use this thing. So the example is a multiple, simple multiplayer game, the you know, text adventure, and <clears throat> Okay, so <clears throat> the first thing that we want uh, <clears throat> for a multiplayer game is to send some commands to the server and then server responds with uh, the outcome of the action. So <clears throat> uh, this is the client, this is the server, okay? <clears throat> and the, cl the, the client, the player, is sending some <clears throat> kind of actions to the server uh, which are identified by his name and the action he wants to perform. And uh, in this case, it's, it's in JSON format, but uh, ZeroMQ is agnostic about the format, so you can send it in XML or binary or whatever you want. It's, a, it's a really up to you. Uh, so the, the client sends the action, the server processes the action, sends the, sends the <coughs> reply, uh, which says like what happened. Once again, it's the, it's the same code that we've seen before. So it's seven lines of code on the, on the client side and seven lines of code on the server side. Plus your business logic, of course. And what ZeroMQ gives you is that automatically this scales. So you can start 10,000 clients and it still works. Right? You don't have to do anything for that. The other thing you want to do in a multiplayer game is to distribute the, the game state to all the clients. Yeah. So every client uh, needs to know like, oh, what happens in, in the game world. So in this case, uh, we distribute the position of the user to, to everyone. So the, the client knows that, the, the, say, the two characters are in the same room or something. And we can use pub subsockets for, uh, for that <clears throat> because, as I said, pub socket sends the, the same data to, to everyone. Yeah. Okay, so, uh, so imagine we combine th this thing and this thing, and what we get as a result is this kind of application. The server has two sockets, one of them is a replier, other one is publisher. The replier is used to get user actions and send the outcomes of the actions to the clients. 
the PubSocket is used to distribute the game state to all the clients. And here, here we have two, uh, the simple example with two clients. <coughs> Each client has a request socket to send the actions to, to the server and get the replies from the server. And the sub is used to uh, get the game, st the game state. Uh, so for example, if, uh, if, if the first client sends some action uh, to the server from the rec socket to the rep socket, and the server determines that you know, game state changed, then <coughs> publishes it through the pub socket, and the state gets to every, every client. <coughs> so this is, the, uh, this is the basic idea uh, of, <coughs> of how to build applications using 0MQ. As I said, uh, these are just two pat patterns, <coughs> Uh, request reply and pub publish subscribe. There are a few more like uh, push pull, which are used for more complex mm, kinds of distributing workload between many servers. But uh, as I said, I'm not going to dig into it into it too much now. Okay, so <coughs> imagine you've, you've made your multiplayer game and uh, you are <coughs> you know, providing it, it as a web service or something. And at some point you have a problem with scaling. Right? So you have uh, many users, and suddenly your single server is not able to accommodate the load. Right? For example, the processing of the game state takes too long, and uh, you know, the response time is too slow, and so on. So you, so you want to scale up. So this is what you can do. Uh, the dotted line is your data center, where you have like the main server. Uh, where all the clients connect. And then you have like a like few boxes that are used to just distribute the load to process the game actions. So, so what you can do is the, the server can inside have a request socket and bind or connect to, uh, to, to the different worker machines. And when the client sends some request to the server, the server can distribute load balance, the request to one of the worker nodes, get the reply and send the reply back to the client. Once again, it's like a few lines of code to, to do this. And, then, uh, and of course, the nice thing is that uh, once there is a performance problem, uh, the, the free boxes for, uh, for processing the, the game state are not enough. You can just start another re reply socket. You don't have to restart anything. It just starts working and the distribution goes over four boxes or five boxes, 10 boxes. And it happens in the runtime without restarting, without reconfiguring anything. You just start it, that's it. Uh, and oh, of course, imagine that uh, <clears throat> your data center is actually cloud. Yeah? So you just buy a few more boxes from Amazon, you start the services there, and the thing scales up. Yeah? Okay, so, uh, this is one example of scaling, and now another problem that may happen. So example, your, your game server is running up in, uh, in Wroclaw, and suddenly you have a lot of uh, users from, <clears throat> from New Zealand. And as we know, New Zealand has a pretty bad connectivity. Uh, well, they do, because uh, you either go, uh, have to go through the satellite, which is slow, or you have to go, uh, go through the undersea cable, which has limited bandwidth, and so on. So uh, the problem is with, with distributing the game state. So if you have 100, uh, 100 uh, clients in the New Zealand, you are sending the same data for 100 times for the same cable. Yeah? So the, your bandwidth is 100 times as, as big. So what you would uh, like to do is to send the data just once to the New Zealand and then distribute it uh, inside New Zealand somehow. So what you can do is this. You just place an, one server in Wellington, which has a very simple application that has two sockets, one sub, one pub. And uh, the, the whole thing that's done in the middle is read a message from, from sub sockets and send it to the pub socket. Read. Send, read, send, read, send. Simple loop, you know, four lines. Yeah? And what happens then is actually the, the server in Wellington connects to the, your data center in Wroclaw. It gets every message once and then distributes it to the local consumers in Wellington, Oakland, Christchurch, and 
suddenly your bandwidth goes down by 99%. Uh, okay, so, <clears throat> okay, 20 minutes are off. Uh, some more features. So uh, this, will, this will be very quick if uh, I don't have much time, but if you want to know more about the different features, uh, just ask me afterwards. So <laughs> zero MQ works with almost any language. So uh, a lot of people are using it actually to interconnect the applications in different languages. So if you ha have some legacy application written in uh, Java or C or something, and you have some other application uh, written in uh, Scala and uh, some other application uh, <coughs> written uh, written in Python or Ruby, you, you can uh, you can connect them all uh, and use ZeroMQ as a glue b b between them. Yeah. Uh, ah, ZeroMQ is actually a library written in C, so it's pretty much portable. Uh, for what I know, uh, it runs on uh, like standard operating systems like Linux, Windows, OS X, uh, FreeBSD, or different flavors of BSD. Uh, then it runs on uh, mobile operating systems, but uh, that's not that easy to build, but people have done it, like iOS and Android. It also runs on all kinds of legacy systems in case you are working for you know, banks or something who have like systems 30, 30 years old. Uh, you probably have to do with AX or HPUX, OpenVMS, mainframes, OS 390. So ZeroMQ runs on all of this. Yeah. Uh, and all, I don't know whether there are any embedded developers, but uh, as far as I know, people were able to use ZeroMQ under QNix and VMworks, VxWorks, and so on. So but once again, it can be used as a glue between mobile applications, server side, mainframe, and so on. <clears throat> okay, uh, one of the special features of ZeroMQ is it was specific, specifically written to be very, very fast. So, <clears throat> uh, I, I don't think the Ruby crowd is really interested in that because, uh, okay, uh, but, <laughs> but, but it's too, too fast for you, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, so if you, if you have a good hardware, uh, you can get the latency down to 20 micro microseconds uh, and the throughput can go up uh, with very small messages to something like six million messages a second or so. But of course, if you are using it from Ruby, it's limited by, uh, by, by the performance of the Ruby binding and the Ruby language itself. So you will see something, I don't know, like a million messages a second. It's variable, it depends maybe up to 200,000, but you also have the garbage collector to account uh -huh. for as well. And given that, yeah, it yeah. won't, it won't also won't be in real time. <coughs> okay, so whatever, so, uh, okay, so 200,000? Probably 200, yeah. yeah. Okay, but, but still, still quite a lot. Yeah, okay, so. <coughs> um, so that's performance. Okay, uh, I am, I'm not a Ruby person, but uh, what, uh, what I know about the, the Python binding, the, actually the guys who created it verse, uh, are doing some kind of scientific computing for uh, physics, and uh, they're, they're building uh, um, HP, HPC cluster uh, in Python. And the problem they had was uh, the Python, Python has a global interpreter lock. And, uh, that means that, that they cannot really scale uh, their applications using the, um, the native means of the Python. So instead of running multiple threads, they just start multiple py Python processes and use ZeroMQ as a glue between the processes. Uh, so they avoid uh, hitting the global, global interpreter lock. Now, as far as I understand in uh, Ruby, at least in MRI, there is a uh, global interpreter lock as well. So maybe it can be used in the, in the same way. <clears throat> okay, uh, one other thing, I don't know how interesting this is, but uh, ZeroMQ works on different kinds of underlying transports. It's not only TCP, so uh, you can either use TCP if you want, but you can also use uh, IPC, which is uh, inter-process communication. So on Unix systems, you have these name, name pipes that you can use for uh, you, well, Unix domain sockets that you can use for communication between processes. Then you have uh, improc transport, which is a communication between two threads. Uh, and uh, PGM is uh, 
well, it's a multicast protocol. So multicast, I don't know, are, are you familiar with multicast? Uh, it's a networking te technology to send one packet to many computers at the same time. Well, and we have some experimental uh, transports already written. One of them is UDP. If you don't need a reliable <coughs> delivery of packets, that's used in the gaming world often. And DNS is a new transport that actually it's like, like generic. So you, you write an, one of the, uh, the endpoints into the DNS entry. And when you specify DNS, it will check the <laughs> DNS and get a string from there and connect to that. So, so you can move the services by, by just changing the recording DNS. OK. Mm. OK, uh, I'm not the web person, so I, I can speak uh, much about that. But uh, people are using ZeroMQ often as a backend for, for, for web. So uh, in, in, on the front end, you have uh, uh, HTTP and web, or web sockets. On the, and on the back, back end, instead of fast CGI or whatever, uh, you use ZeroMQ. So there are several projects that, uh, that are doing that. Mongrel2 is a web server uh, written by Zed Show. Uh, actually, I think he, he, he pissed off the whole Ruby community at this time. So, but, but anyway, <laughs> uh, uh, Mongrel2, uh, web, web server, front end, HTTP web sockets, back end, 0MQ. 0GV, uh, basically the same thing, by, uh, written by other guy. Uh, no MQ, I haven't looked at it, but uh, as far as I understand, it's the re-implementation of the same concept, uh, concepts without actually using 0MQ in browser. So check it. And NGX 0MQ is, an, uh, uh, is a module for uh, NGINX that uh, uses 0MQ uh, communication to communicate with uh, backend applications. OK, uh, that's web. Uh, license is LGPL, which means you can link it with proprietary applications. Right? The, the only thing that the LGPL requires is that if you modify the ZeroMQ itself, you have to, have to contribute it back. And uh, on iOS, the, there's a problem with static, uh, because you have to statically link the libraries on iOS. So there is a special ex exception that allows you to statically link ZeroMQ with your proprietary applications. Uh, here are some users. So uh, what you see here is uh, there are some users like uh, you know scientific computing like CERN. Uh, um, actually, the guys in CERN were considering using ZeroMQ for <laughs> controlling the Large Hadron Collider. I don't know whether it uh, whether it happened or no, but okay. Uh, uh, then you have some uh, Los Alamos laboratories that that's scientific computing as well. AT and T that's uh, Telecom, uh, GitHub, Spotify, web services, yeah? uh, Twitter. Uh, Twitter actually uses it for uh, the process, uh, large scale processing for big data. <laughs> so processing the whole Twitter feed and uh, doing some analytics on it. Uh, uh, Veta is the is the company that uh, owned by the Peter Jackson, you know, the Lord of the Rings avatar. So uh, there are animation studio and uh, the, they are using zero MQ for probably distributing the work between uh, in the cluster of uh, rendering services. Okay, so uh, more information on zero MQ.org or well, as, as I said, we are going to fork it. So maybe in two weeks, uh, there will be crossroads IO domain as well. Okay, that's it. Wow. <laughs> No. If you send a message and the second process is down, the message is lost. 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 It's, it's just, uh, think of it as a networking stack. It's, it's like, like TCP. If one client dies, well. that I have no experience with Ruby. So what's the problem? Uh, problems, uh, problem with the ZeroMQ uh, library is uh, it's hard to deploy on uh, 
preferred application cloud like Heroku, Engine Yard, or, uh, or something like this. Uh, so, as uh, so, I said, I can the application with this license that I learned here, mm -hmm. and I can't deploy it on Heroku. You mean because it's a native library or what? Uh, uh, because it's a native library, yes. Just see, Th that's the problem, right? Yeah, that's the problem. Well, <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it, it didn't see. Sorry, <laughs> the, the, the original goal was to make it fast, so it so didn't see. Well, uh, there's no no, no no easy solution for now. Uh, one thing I would like to do in a long term, like I mean, 10 or 15 years, is uh, actually getting it into kernel. So it would, would be like an integral part of the Linux. Uh, the, the, extension, the extension already exists. Uh, I can give you the link. You can uh, build your own kernel with, like, in, in kernel 0 and Q, but you know, that's going to happen in 10 years or something. So until then. UDP binding? When will this be? Well, the, 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 the patch is actually online somewhere. Uh, I can check for the link. But. Uh, I, I would like you uh, to include it into mainline like in, in a month or two or something. Okay. So. You want to uh, yeah, just about uh, the question you had. So does anyone know if it's possible to install a gem with native extensions on Europe at all? Uh, you can install a gem with native extensions. Okay, so then, you, uh, then it's not a problem because it's... it's it is kind of a problem because uh, you can, uh, let's say, uh, the issue I had was uh, external gem. Well, you, um, the, the binding that I maintain, I basically I package the whole uh, the tarball in, 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 the, in the gem, and at build time you, you just unpack and deploy it, um, so you link it in the runtime. Yeah, the now, the support is okay. having uh, okay. a Okay. 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 Is uh, what happens under the hood, uh, whether there are uh, threads there, and how can the user control uh, what's happening uh, inside the library. So, the library, as you can see, it has the native threads inside, and you can specify the number of threads you want to run. So, uh, the, normally, given that it's this path, uh, that you can pass like uh, signaling messages second per single thread, uh, you want only run, uh, one thread under the hood. But if you are running some kind of super computing cluster or something, uh, you can specify more. The rule of the thumb is uh, to have one, uh, one internal worker thread per one gigabit per second. So if you are going over one gigabit a second. All right. Thank you very much.